honor to have today Professor Ray Mooney from University of Texas Austin, Computer Science Department. Uh, this talk is um, hosted by the Department of Computer Science and also the Ken Kennedy Institute. Uh, so the Ken Kennedy Institute actually has a series of talks throughout uh, you know, the year. So I encourage you to attend uh, the other lecture series of the Ken Kennedy Institute, including September 28th, there's going to be Tushar Chandra, who's a, an engineer at White Waymo, and I believe he was also one of the co-authors of one of these uh, huge big table papers at Google back in the day with Jeff Dean and all the people there. Um, anyway, so Professor Ray Mooney is an expert in machine learning, natural language processing. He has been working for, is it more than 30 years? And, almost uh, 40 at this point. Almost 40, there you go. And uh, a fellow of the ACL, ACM, and Foundation for the Advancement in Artificial Intelligence. And he has also served in various roles through the years, being chair for EMNLP, ICML, AAAI, and various points. And he has won paper awards at AAAI, KDD, ICML, ACL, and all other accolades. So, you know, welcome. Good. Thanks, So, uh, yeah, so I'm happy to be here. I've been in Austin for 34 years. Where the line I tell people is I've now been a professor there for over a third of a century. So I've been in Texas a long time, but I unfortunately I never really knew any of the faculty here personally, so I've never made it to Rice. So when I knew Vincente was here, it was like, ah, I'd love him coming to, to visit sometime. I also have relatives in the area, so it's nice to, it was nice to spend a nice weekend with them. So it's quite nice to finally come to Rice after spending over a third of a century in Austin. I have been to uh, UH a, a number of years ago. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about my work on Dialogue with Robots. I subtitled Perceptually Grounded Communication with Lifelong Learning. And this is joint work with a number of people. Jesse and Ashwari are my former PhD students. Jesse's now uh, assistant professor at USC. Ashwari is in the Amazon Alexa group. Uh, Jibco was a postdoc when he worked at UT. He's now at Tufts University. Peter Stone is my robotics colleague at UT Austin. Uh, Shiki was a former post, and Justin were former postdocs of his, and Max was an undergraduate when this work was, was done. Okay, so th there's this whole thing I mentioned to several people today called Robo NLP, which is about putting, you know, let, uh, being able to command and tell robots what to do in natural language. So commanding, teaching, and collaborating with increasingly capable robots I think is greatly aided by humans being able to communicate with them in ordinary natural language like English. And there are a lot of robots that people have built natural language interfaces to here, like the now robot they, they use to play Robocop. This one here, this is, uh, my colleague Peter calls it a, 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 a Segbot. It's a, a robot based on a Segway base, and you'll see a video of it. And this has a Canova arm on it. This is a, what is this a Baxter or what? I forget. So I went to, where's my robotic, where's my robotics colleague? Yeah, yeah, this is a Baxter robot. Some people have done some nit you know, natu natural language work with that. And this is a robot parklift that was done at MIT. I was talking to show people about Steffi Tellich, who's a, a good friend of mine who worked on natural language interfaces to telling this robotic parklift to do. So people have built natural language interfaces to a variety of different robotic platforms to try to get them to inter communicate with language and, and get them to do things from language commands in various cases. So uh, what really is one of my core research interests for a very long time is what I usually call language grounding, which inquires, uh, I teach a graduate seminar in this, I say language ground, grounded natural language processing is connecting language to action and perception in the world. And if we're going to do language with robots, it really requires exactly that, grounding language in the relevant perception and action in the world. And multimodal deep learning has resulted in amazing recent progress in this area of connecting multiple modalities, particularly vision and language, to, to build amazing system, multimodal systems that can do some amazing things. And I'll do a quick review of sort of some of the work in this. So I've been interested in grounded language for quite a long time. And, and I helped organize the first workshop on what we call integrating language and vision. This was at NURIPS, or it was then called NIPS. Um, in 2011, so it's you know more than 10 years ago now. It was a pretty small group. Vincente was reminding me that he was actually at this workshop when it was held in 2011. It was in a beautiful ski resort outside of Granada, Spain, called Sierra Nevada. 
Uh, but there were maybe like 30 people there. Do you think? I, you know how many people were there in Vincente? Uh, it's 30, 40 at most, right? It was a very small community back in those days. Then in the fall of 2014, I remember this very well because I was actually on sabbatical at Microsoft Research in Redmond. Um, these variety of papers came out applying deep learning, in particular LSTMs, for those of you who know what that is, to image captioning. And oh my god, they made a big splash. These were all submissions to CDPR that year, if I remember right. And then since then, pow, the area just blew up after that. And it's like I'm grown amazingly. I used to say I knew everybody who worked on language and vision. I have no way anyone can say that now, right? It's, there's so many people have gone into the area. So just give me an eye on some of the work that's gone on in this area. So a big one is image and video captioning, where we want to produce a natural language sentence describing an image. So you get an image like this, and you want to generate a nice natural language description, like a large brown bear walking through a forest. Uh, I've done a little bit of work on image captioning, but Zente worked on this probably even when you were a grad student, right? You know, So uh, I work more on video captioning, where you're given a, a, a short video in this case. This is a YouTube video. You got to give an entertaining example when you give a talk. So, and you know, you want to look at that video and then maybe generate a caption like a monkey pulls a dog's tail and runs away. Uh, another big topic within grounded and language and sort of vision and language is VQ, it's called VQ, a visual question. You answer a natural language question about an image or video. So you get an image like this and you ask, have to ask the question, answer the question, I'm sorry, what is in the child's mouth? Uh, and then you get an image like this and you're asked what color is the surfboard. And so you have nat images with natural language questions, so you have to integrate the modalities to be able to produce a natural language answer to these questions. Another problem that's been studied quite a bit is natural language robot navigation, where you provide, typically this has been done in simulation. There's been a little bit of work with real robots, but most of it is in simulation. You give a robot natural language navigation instructions to follow, and then it has to follow them. So this was first done in a maze domain, and I did some of this. was originally work put by my former colleague, Ben Kuypers, who's a roboticist, who's now unfortunately left us to move to the University of Michigan because his wife became a dean there, and not because he didn't love Austin. Um, he generated this data, and I was the first one to apply machine learning to this, to say you'd have to learn to follow these instructions, like take your first left, go all the way down until you hit a dead end, you know, and follow. Now, this has turned into a pretty widely studied uh, benchmark called VLN, Vision Language Navigation, where you have these very rich uh, simulations of houses in 3D, and then you have this sort of simulated robot that has to follow these natural language instructions to navigate through this house to get to some place, and you have these instructions. So this is what an image looks like, and it's, it's actually synthetically generated with a very high res you know, graphics uh, renderer. It says, go up the stairs, turn right, go past the bathroom, and stop next to the bed. And you have to actually have control the robot to follow those directions. So took over all these areas uh, and uh, have, were very successful. In the early days, the initial systems were built with a combination of using convolutional neural networks to do the vision and then using recurrent neural networks, particularly LSTMs, long short-term memories, and GRUs, uh, gated recurrent units were popular. And then, of course, we all know, with, what's it been like three, four years ago now? Everything got taken over by transformers, right? Where you use transformer models with cross-modal attention and pre-training on very large multimodal corpora, either of you know images and, and text or video and, and, and captions and various sorts of multimodal sources. This is an example of one model. It's been a few years. There's a whole bunch of this stuff. There's Vilbert and VL and, and you know Video Bird and you know, and a bunch of different models, Lexmert, there's, I forget all the different ones that people have done. This is one out of Microsoft Research called Uniter, which at least at one point had the state of the art on a lot of these grounded language tasks, where you do mass language model training, but you mass things in various ways, and you train these networks to, you know, infer information in the language from the video and our, our image, and used to infer information in the image from the rest of the image in the language, and you do all this masking to try to build a, one unified network that can do all this masked training where it tries to predict missing pieces of the input. And you pre-train it on huge amounts of multimodal data, and it produces amazing results on a variety of these sort of grounded language problems that we talked about, VQA captioning, all these sorts of things. So this is all great. You know, one's a, no one's a bigger fan of the progress in deep learning that has happened over the last five years or more than I am, but it requires enormous amounts of training data 
and compute power to be effective. And even then, it's on, I was talking to several people here about Ziff's Law. How many people here know what Ziff's Law is? I've got curious, because a number of people said they don't know what Ziff's Law is. I thought all computer scientists should learn this. But, but you know, the, the, in language and in a lot of, of, of data, there's a long, uh, uh, long tail, or usually it's probably better called a heavy tail, where there's a lot of data is out in these rare cases. And a lot of times, you just sample data from the distribution. You're not going to see all that rare cases, even though they might come up in practice. Um, so ideally, I think a robot should continue to learn through natural interaction until I train it up as much as I can in pre-training. Pre-training is all the rage in, in NLP these days, and, and I'm all for it. But at the end of the day, there's still going to be things that you're lacking. And you, when you push the system out into the world, you want it to continue to be able to learn. And to do that learning through natural interaction with its users, not any specific labeled training data of any sort, but just it goes out in the world, it interacts with its users, and it learns from that experience to get better and better over time. And this is this idea of lifelong learning. Adapting to the demands of specific tasks and specific environments, particular users, by continuing to learn through its lifetime. Um, and like I said, this is this idea of lifelong learning, to continually learn and acquire new concepts from data naturally obtained during everyday deployment. This is what I mean by lifelong learning. People can use this term in different ways. And one thing that my former student, Aishwari, and I tried to argue was is a great way to do this is through natural language dialogue, by just communicating in natural language dialogue with your humorous users and trying to learn from that interaction continuously. So we wrote this sort of position paper uh, called Dialogue as a Vehicle for Lifelong Learning and put it in this special track. SIGDIAL is a, the Natural Language Processing Conference on Dialogue that happens every year. And actually, I gave the first talk, version of this talk I gave was as an invited talk at SIGDIAL last year. Um, uh, and I really think dialogue is a great way to do lifelong learning. So we've looked at particular types of dialogue where the agent can ask two types of questions to its users. One is clarification questions that elucidate the current user's intent. If you ask the robot to do something, it's not quite clear, the robot's not quite clear what the user wants. And so it asks these clarification questions to try to clarify. So say, you know, the user asks for wine, it might ask, did you want red or white wine? Active learning, presumably a lot of you heard of the concept of active learning, where the, the system itself asks for labels on examples that it's finding difficult so that it can learn from them, where the questions provide useful supervision uh, for system-selected training examples. So maybe the robot sees this funky thing on the table, and it doesn't know what it is. It's very uncertain about what type of object it is, and it might ask the question, is this a decanter? Maybe it's only seen a couple examples of decanters in the past. In fact, it sort of asks about this one. So we asked the question, how can we build a system that can use dialogue, interact with its users, be able to know when to ask clarification questions, when to ask active learning questions, to, to help users as best it can now and in the future by learning things that might be needed, not needed in the future. So again, if you don't know much about active learning, instead of just dumping a bunch of labeled data on a system, the query has to act, the system has to actively query, hey, that's an example I really could learn a lot from if I knew what the label was. So here I get this simple 2D example, or maybe I have these set of, so I have some points labeled red, some labeled blue, and the idea is the black ones are unlabeled. I don't know whether they're red, blue, or black, blue or red. So then if I, the system wanted to select example that it would learn the most from, if it got the label, presumably it would probably want to select one of these examples up here with the question mark, not one of these black points embedded in the middle of the blues and the reds, because you're probably pretty certain that those are blues and reds. But the one on the boundary that has a low margin, you know, to the, the classifier divider are where different reasonable hypotheses would disagree are really examples you would learn a lot from if you know the label. So there's a whole body of work on active learning. I'm talking to several people here, it even goes back to like theoretical work in learning back in the 70s. People try to say, what's the right strategy to ask about examples to learn from as few examples as possible by actively querying, not just expecting labeled the data to just you know, come to you. Uh, so we've tried to develop robot dialogue systems and other sort of grounded language query systems, we'll see some more simulated results later, um, using both clarification and active learning queries to support lifelong learning. And there's a JR Journal article on this from a couple of years ago that has a lot of detail about our earlier work on this. And in terms of real robot demonstrations, we demonstrated this with natural, using the task of natural language object retrieval, where you ask a robot to go get something somewhere else and take it somewhere. With the segue-based mobile robot that, that my colleague uh, 
uh, Peter calls a segbot. And it has a little Canova arm attached to it that it can use to pick things up. So I'm going to show this video that we put together a couple of years ago demonstrating this system. This is an agent in these clarification questions. Okay, so it thinks I don't understand this rattling concept. Maybe I have to ask some active learning queries to, to learn this concept so I can execute this command. It doesn't think it has enough examples at this point to learn an accurate concept, so it continues to act ask these active warning queries. We're collecting both audio and visual data when it's learning from this situation. So this is, you get the eight times speed up. Every robot demo video has to have this, where you don't want to watch the slow things that you did. <laughs> <laughs> this is our actual uh, you know, offices at UT. Now, these, it's explored these objects before. You have to understand it's familiar with these objects and manipulated them before, and it's, it's picked them up and dropped them and done everything and collected all the data. That's a little bit unclear from this demo. Yeah, so. So it already has a bunch of data. It's explored these objects before, and it knows their audio, haptic, and uh, visual properties. And it decides that, oh, based on all that data, this is the thing that it thinks class fits the, the description of being rattling. I have to speed up again as it navigates through. That's the RoboCup, RoboCup uh, uh, lab there, where Peter plays with his robots that play soccer. <laughs> Okay, so that's the cute little uh, demo that demonstrates sort of what we're trying to, to do, which is have a robot that can engage you in a dialogue, learn from that dialogue, and hopefully over time, through just that interaction with the user, learns to do tasks better and understand language better. So one part of this was learning from dialogue clarifications. This is earlier work we did, inferring training data for semantic parsing from answers to clarification questions. So the semantic parsing is thing that takes the natural language, turns it into some formal <coughs> representation that you can give to the robot to execute commands. And this idea of learning from clarification dialogues to improve semantic parsing was originally uh, or, originated with, with Joab Artsy and Luke Zettelmeyer at UW. Joab's now at, at Cornell Tech. Uh, it, the MNLP in 2011, they did this in a non-grounded setting in travel planning dialogues, booking an airplane flight or something. 
But so we adapted it to work in this grounded setting where we're trying to get objects to retrieve uh, things from natural language commands. And we evaluated it in both simulated and real environments. So here's the simulated ones where we run large, sort of larger scale experiments. Where we set up this sort of Turk task on Mechanical Turk, where we show a picture of a set of objects, and then we try to tell the person, get the robot to, to you know, accomplish some goal. And this one says, Dave Daniel wants the item in slot five. It also has names for people, but it has a little table that isn't shown here that shows like their job uh, title, maybe what their nickname is. So it can refer to those people in various different ways. Uh, and so this is a particular actual Turk user that's interacting with the system. This is how can I help. It says, please bring the item in slot five. So this user really didn't understand the task because we wanted them to describe what these objects were, you know, but they thought, oh, they could just refer to it by the slot name, which is not what we intended. But it's nice to see how the system recovers from that. So the system doesn't understand that. And so it asks the question again, what did you want that you want me to bring today, Daniel? Then they realize, oh, I can't refer to it by the slot number. So he says calendar. So you want to see what's wrong with this, though, from a text side? It's, it's actually misspelled, right? So it says, I'm sorry, I couldn't figure that out. Then they try a day planner. And it says, I'm sorry, I couldn't figure this out. Then they finally realize that they mistyped calendar, because it only has a very limited vocabulary that it knows at this point of how to refer to these objects. And then they say calendar. And they go, OK, you want me to bring the calendar to Dave Daniel? They say yes. And then they think that the robot now believes it understands what the user wants, and it goes off. The point is, there's the issue of knowing what clarification questions to ask. There's been a lot of work in dialogue for that. But we're really focused on is what can we learn from this after the fact to make up for this and do better in the future? It comes with implicit training data here about what this, this means and what that, and so we collect training data from this, that this must be the same as that, and that, that count, whoops, sorry, um, calendar must be the same as calendar misspelled, which must be the same as day planner, and it creates training data automatically to improve the semantic parser, and it collects training data from that clarification dialogue exchange goes off, retrains the semantic parser, hopefully it's better the next time. And just by this interaction and learning from the clarification questions, hopefully it gets better over time. So we ran a, si a simulation study for this, where we had 50 users interact with the system in batches of four. We had 50 users, then we collected all their training data, we retrained, we did another 50 users, another 50 users, and so we had these four batches. And we looked at how well did the system improve from batch to batch as it's learned from its previous conversations and clarification dialogues to improve things in the future. So we saw that then at the end of, of this task, we asked the user this question, did the robot understand what you wanted? And then they asked this Likert, they have to answer on this Likert scale. And we see over time, as with the further batches, users say the robot understood them better because it's learning from its previous interactions just through those clarification dialogues. This is a more quantitative or, or you know, objective measure, which is, did it actually accomplish the task of uh, how long was the dialogue that it took to eventually accomplish? Because it keeps asking clarifications until it thinks it's figured it out. Initially, oh my god, the dialogues are very long, right? Because it, it doesn't know anything. It has to clarify all sorts of things. And then over time, it learns, and its dialogues get shorter and shorter and shorter, because it's learning, and it doesn't ask, have to ask as many questions, and it's accomplishing things with shorter dialogues. And this is just a, we had people type in qualitative comments, and the one, that user that I think from that, that example I showed you, they said, oh, the robot can fix my typo. Um, OK. We also did this in a, with the real robot. Again, this is on a much more limited scale. We had 10 users interact with a baseline system that started with very minimal training data. Then we had the robot roam the office for four days. It had 30 conversations, 34 conversations with users that ended in it actually getting some goal of something to do. And then we retrained it on the data that it collected from those dialogues. And then we had 10 new users interact with the train system after it had learned from that interaction over four days of just interacting with other users. And we, we had them do these delivery tasks, and we saw that, you know, after it learned, it obviously did a lot better. It learned from those interactions over those four days and could accomplish more delivery tasks successfully than it could in the first batch. And of course, we did this, this Likert scale thing where people in the second batch agreed that the system understood them a lot better than initially. So it indicates that through these clarification dialogues, we can build a system that just naturally learns from these interactions and gets better over time at understanding language and improving the semantic parser that understands that language. Okay, any quick questions about that before I? Move on, yeah. Um, 
Okay. When you mentioned about the batch, do you mean different group of people or the people, the same people about asking? This is done on Turk, so I think they may, some of them might be the same because it depends who does the Turk task. I don't think we ban people from not doing multiple times, but these are just put up as tasks on Mechanical Turk. I don't know how many of you have used Amazon Mechanical Turk. So some of them might overlap, but they, they also might be different. It just depends on what ask Amazon crowdsourcer picked up that task. Did you ask the same question? They ask the same questions. No, because they're experiencing a different system then, right? Because it's been learned since then. So hopefully it's better. And so it's going to ask different questions because it's not the same system in batch one that it was in batch zero and so forth. Because it's learned, it's constantly updating its language understanding as it learns from these conversations. I was wondering, does the robot use language templates? The questions generated, yeah, those are basically template driven. There's no like generation model behind that. It's it has things that it knows it can query about it, then it has natural language templates that generate the actual natural language question back so, for that clarification. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so if a first time a user uh, asks a question and the system goes through a very long interaction and uh, clarification right. actually learning, so next time, so if I ask exactly the same question. Oh, it'll get it right now. Yeah. So, so will the, the system just regularly do the same thing without any uh, further questions? Yeah. I mean, it probably should. I, I didn't try that exact question over again, but the semantic parser learner, if it's done its job and it's pretty good, it will have learned the right language interpretation word the second time. It will understand that, you know. And you can call the thing a day calendar or misspelled calendar or whatever, and it's learned to be able to, to, to parse those, those, those examples correctly. That just, it, it's, it's basically just getting the training data correct. So assuming that it's overfit prevention didn't prevent it from getting that data, then yeah, you'll definitely get it right. Yeah, so for the video example, I'm, I'm interested in whether the robot can understand the rather correctly. So how do you know it's understanding correctly rather than based on the packaging or the appearance of the bottle too? Oh, you don't, I mean, you know. It's an empirical question, how, what good of a definition of rattling say that it's learned? I mean, I just showed you a cute little example, but you know, the experiments sort of demonstrate, the later ones I'll show you where we act, that we haven't done active learning yet, and that was, that was just for clarification. We're getting to the active learning part. And when we get to the active learning part, we have experiments that demonstrate that, yeah, but it's, it's doing machine learning. So, you know, I mean, I think it has learned, in some sense, the right definition, because it's, it's I think we looked at this in various, one, one ways you can look is what channel of the multimodal input is it looking at? I think, you know, Jesse did look at that rattling classifier, and it's, it's looking at the audio, right? It does learn that, oh, identify rattling by looking at the audio that happens when I drop the object. I'm pretty sure he looked at these things. And, I see. Yeah, it is learning to listen what it sounds like when you drop the object, and that's how it determines whether it's rattling or not. Now, is a perfect definition of rattling? You know, probably not. Yeah. So, so, so uh, another question is that, so we'll, take, we'll tell the uh, robot to watch? Does, does it do, like, watch and listen at the same time? Again, there, just to get the demo to work, there's certain <laughs> commands that are put in there to get the robot to go from one yeah. mode to another. So there's a little bit of, of clunky interaction there just because, you know, the way the demo was set up. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so now let's get, that's more on the clarification side. Let's get more into the active learning side. So active learning normally assumes, it's usually called pool-based sampling, or different types of active learning, but the standard thing when people talk about active learning is pool-based sampling, where you have a large number of just unlabeled examples just sitting there all the time, and you can ask about any one of them at any given time. So it normally assumes continual access to a large body of unlabeled examples. In a grounded robot setting, only a small number of nearby items are generally around. You don't have all the objects in the world just lying around the, your, your office for the robot to point to and ask about. It's like in a particular setting, you know, it happens to go into this room, there happens to be this weird glass thing on the table, and they goes, that's a weird thing, maybe I should ask what that is. And they go, oh, it's a decanter or whatever. Um, so we call this opportunistic active learning, because you, you're exposed to certain data at a particular time, and you have to learn, you have to ask, Am I, is it even worth asking a question? And if I ask a question about what something is, what should I pick in the room to ask about? So we call this opportunistic active learning. Ask locally convenient queries during an interactive task. And those queries may be useful for the current task, but they may not be, have nothing to do with what this user cares about. They might be something that the robot is, quote, curious about, if I can use that term, that it finds very unusual in the environment that it doesn't have a label for that it wants to ask about. So this is an example of like a, 
a, what we call an on-topic query, where the, the person asks about a blue mug and doesn't know blue, so it asks about blue. But it can also ask what we call off-topic, which is they're asking about a blue mug, but it sees this weird thing and thinks maybe that all that it's been learning applies to that, but it's not sure, so it asks. But this is off-topic. It's not going to help this user, but if it gets a good labeled example for tall, it might help the next user ask about tall things. So you have to decide when and what active learning queries to ask to properly trade off immediate task completion, because you don't want to distract user with question after question after question, and future task performance. So a few years ago, we developed this algorithm that uses reinforcement learning to learn a policy for when to ask questions and what questions to ask in an opportunistic active learning setting. Um, so there's a long history of using reinforcement learning. Again, I hope a lot of you have been exposed to reinforcement learning. That's a whole big topic. But there's been a long history of using reinforcement learning to learn a policy for a dialogue. How do you, does the system know what questions to ask when? There's been a lot of work on using reinforcement learning to do that. In fact, there's a, the earliest thing happened at AT&T Labs, uh, uh, and, and, and it was a NIPS paper back in 1999 that initiated this. And the rewards usually come from either a user satisfaction survey at the end of the dialogue, where you get a large positive reward for achieving some task-based goal, but then you get a small negative reward every time you ask a question, because you don't want the system to be too verbose. So you want to discourage it from asking questions, but if it's going to be a useful enough question that eventually allows you to get a big reward at the end in this sort of standard RL delayed reward setting, then maybe it's worth asking the question. It has to learn a policy that properly trades, you know, sets its behavior to properly, properly trade off those two goals of keeping the dialogue sharp but being good at the task. So we try to evaluate this, uh, and it's hard to do this in, in uh, a real setting. So we did this in simulation. Very common in active learning to do simulated studies where you're not actually asking the questions to real users. You have a label, big label data set that you can answer any of the questions if it, the system just poses it. So it's, uh, you ha we're actually using visual genome of people and about this data set. This is a little bit old, but this work was from a few years ago. Um, to, to simulate the answers. It already has labels on all these objects. Uh, and it allowed you to ask queries on a small set of available training examples to identify an object in a test set. So here's the picture that gives you an idea of what the setup looks like. The idea is we have what we call over here the active test set. The user describes in language some object in this active test set. So here it says a white umbrella. These are just the objects that happen to be lying around. We call the active training set. The user can, the system can ask questions about these objects, not just any random example in the data set, but only these set of objects. And I have to decide, is there something in that current set that's worth asking about that I can learn from that will, will improve my long-term reward? And maybe, it, you know, it can ask different types of questions. It can ask what we call label queries, where you can say, is there something in train picture number six that you would call yellow? We call that a label query, because asking what is is, does this label apply to this example? And then we can also ask this example query, which is, can you show me an image with something that can be described as white? And then the user gives an example that fits that, that query, rather than answering yes or no to a label query. Um, and then eventually it decides that, oh, I know enough information I can answer, the, and I can pick, okay, I, now I think I know what the test item you want is, it's number, it's, uh, number four, which is the white umbrella in this case. Okay, so is the setup clear? The agent, now, ideally, you would start this on a large pre-trained data set, but we're trying to demonstrate the value of doing this learning from interaction. So we actually start the, the algorithm completely stupid. It knows nothing. It has to learn everything through this active interaction. And it has to learn a policy of asking the right question at the right time that allows it to learn as quickly as possible to accomplish the task of picking out the right thing and keeping the dialogue sharp. Remember, it's getting negative reward every time it asks a question. So it needs to learn a policy that balances active learning with task completion. Now, there's a lot of details in the RL stuff we use. We use a generic, very generic RL method called reinforce. Um, but there's too many states and actions here to learn from a table setting in RL. People know RL. We, we encode the states and actions as features and then uh, you know, learn from those features rather than a table-based method. There's a lot of feature engineering in, 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 this, in this sort of approach to RL where you have to give it the right features to learn from. There are lots of techniques in active learning that propose different metrics for what makes a good example. And we put those in because it's like, OK, give it an idea of what might be good examples. And then features that look at the, the confidence of the classifiers, 
and it eventually tries to learn from that what the right trade-off between asking questions and, and, and uh, guessing what the item is. So we had first started out, we just trained it on 2,000 dialogues. We're, it's, this is all in simulation where this, the data set is actually answering the questions because we have labels on all this data, thanks to all the work that was done at Sanford on, you know, on visual genome. But then it learns to ask questions to learn all of these concepts from this interaction. And then we freeze the dialogue and we test it on 1,000 new simulated dialogues, which are guaranteed to contain concepts, words that it's never seen during training. So we purposely put, so keep some words that never occurred during training. So it's going to have to ask questions to learn their word. There's just no other option. Has it learned the right policy to know what questions to ask and when to ask them to maximize my long-term reward? So when we plot performance on this task, we do this on success rate versus the number of of system terms, or which is sort of the length of the, of the dialogue. So ideally, you want, with very short dialogues, be able to identify the object that the user is talking about. So you ideally want to be up there. And we hand-built a static policy. And we tried to do a good job at this, is taking all these features and building the policy of when should I ask the active learning questions? Well, when there's a very uncertain example. There's a standard technique in the active learning called uncertain sampling. The details of all of this are in the paper. But by using reinforcement learning, we were able to learn a much better policy than what we were able to hand code, where it's a better trade-off because you're getting much greater success rate here, and the dialogue's actually shorter. So it's win-win. It's actually learning a much better policy along both dimensions than we were able to hand code to start with, which is sort of showing that you can learn when to ask the right questions in order to learn to do this task effectively. And I think I'll skip that part of the slide. OK, so is that part clear? So that I talked about learning to ask learning from clarification questions. And then I talked about how to learn policy to act, ask good active learning questions to learn effectively. Yeah. What happens in a case if um, a one word label has multiple natural language meanings? So for example, sure. I'm talking to my car and asking it to take light. the green usually, route. The example I usually use for that is light, right? Because light could be light weight. Or it could be light color, right? Yeah. You know, give me the light cup. Was it the light colored cup or the, the, the cup that's not very heavy or something? So yeah, so the, but that just means that the, the concept, the classifier it has to learn for that word is disjunctive. So that, that the, it's the burdens on the learner to figure out, well, either a light weight object or a light colored object satisfies that classifier. That just all goes into the machine learning algorithm. So it's gonna, the machine, machine learning algorithm is gonna have to learn to resolve that ambiguity. But that's not, it doesn't, and you know, I guess that, they, now the fact that that word is ambiguous is probably going to cause the classifier to take longer to learn a competent classifier, which means I'm probably going to ask more questions about that concept. But it sort of happens naturally because since the word's ambiguous, it's going to get a lot of predictions wrong. It's going to learn. It's very uncertain in that concept, and so it's going to ask more questions about it. But it doesn't do anything specific for that case. I think it does do the right thing in that case to resolve the ambiguity, but it sort of happens naturally from the fact that you're always selecting things that are, you're uncertain about. And an ambiguous concept, you're likely to be more uncertain about. Sorry. Yeah, I have a question uh, similar to next question. So if we have a malicious user who's giving wrong ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah. yeah. So we have to No, we, we're sort of assuming a cooperative user here. Now, now a malicious user, we don't do anything special for that. It's going to add noise into the training data. It's going to screw things up. I think it's going to destroy it, because hopefully we're, if we're only dealing with only adversarial users, then we're totally screwed. But if you have some adversarial learners in there, hopefully the learning algorithm will, with its overfit policy, learn to ignore their labels. And it's going to have to learn. But it's going to definitely, we don't do anything special. We assume, basically, a cooperative agent. But if we have one or two, you know, and this can happen on Turk. Right, you know, malicious users, it's not going to totally screw the system up. Now, if we had all malicious users, then you get nowhere, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, so do you mind to go back to a few slides? Uh, more. Uh, a little bit more. Oh, uh, yeah, here. So, yeah, my question is um, actually, uh, just like, maybe two more. <laughs> Sorry. What? No. Oh. Uh, just me, yeah. Uh, yeah here, 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 fine. So yeah, my question is, for example, if you have like a, a series of active training sets, and so all the way until the end, you get the, tra the actual training, you have to go through several trainings. Uh, that brings me a, a question is, uh, what if like in one of the trainings, the active learning makes some mistakes, so they have to go back again? Did that like cause some like time consuming problem? 
Sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Yeah. But. yeah. So I'm trying to ask is like, if this kind of uh, learning model will cause like time consum consuming problems. Sure. But it, remember, it's getting negative reward every time it asks a question. So that discourages it from asking questions. But if they're valuable enough, then it will help it eventually get a positive reward at the end of the task that's going to do it. So in the, it's the R algorithm that's learning to trade that off to maximize long-term average reward is what normal R algorithm maximizes. Okay. Thank you. And that's exactly what the R algorithm is learning, is what's the right policy to trade those off in the right way? Okay, so now we've tried to put them together. I've talked about clarification questions. I've talked about active questions. How do we build a dialogue agent that can do both? Sometimes it knows it needs to clarify things. Sometimes it needs to know it needs to learn a new concept and an active query. So this is a paper uh, now almost a couple years ago at AAAI 21, where we developed a system that does both. It uses RL to learn a dialogue policy that includes both clarification and active learning questions. It can ask what we call attribute clarification question, which is, does this object have this attribute? And it can ask AOL queries. So we use this fashion data set. Now again, we're doing this all in simulation. So this data actually has been fully labeled. But we're going to learn it from a sort of active setting where we start out with no label data and it has to query the right examples. I mean, this is called the iMaterialist fashion attribute data. And I don't even know what some of these concepts mean. Does anyone know what gingham is? I don't know what gingham is. I'd have to ask, is this thing gingham or not? I don't know what gingham is, or argyle or something, you know? And so peplum, what the heck is? I still don't know what peplum is. Um, so these images, this has been laboriously annotated. But we're asking, what could we do with a system that had to query to get just the smallest number of labeled examples to learn these tasks? And you know, there's sort of some interesting, and this all has to be done from the vision side, right? These aren't pre-labeled with these attributes. You have to look at the the dress and decide whether or not it's gingham or not from an image classifier. So we set up the same framework. You have an active training set that you can pick examples that you can point to and ask questions about. And then you have an active test set from which the test example you have to identify is selected. So say, I want the system to find that example. So we use, there is a natural language description of each of these objects that comes with this data. So we give it that description. But we pretend like a user asked for that thing. But it doesn't really know what any of these words mean right now. It has to learn that through this interactive process. And so the, you know, this is a simulated, but again, let me be clear, this is all done in simulation. There's no real users here. But we're using this label data to sort of simulate the user's answers to these questions. So you get a query. And then it can ask all sorts of questions now. It can ask a clarification, which is something like this. Would you like one that's black? So it does know certain attributes. At this point, at any given point, it's learned classifiers for some number of attributes that it's seen before. And it can ask, well, do you want one that's black? It will help me identify <coughs> out of this active test set which item you're talking about if I know if you'd like something black or not. Maybe the user says yes, because that polka dotted thing was black in the test image. Um, and then the user responds with yes or no. You can ask a label query, which is something like, um, you know, can you, can you give me an example from the active training set that satisfies some query? Like you can ask, could, would you describe this item as sleeveless? And then the user can answer yes or no. You can ask what we call an example query, which you can ask something like, can you show me something that you would describe as chiffon? And then the user can pick something and show it. Uh, and then finally, it can decide, OK, I think I know what you want. I'm going to guess this item. And then if it gets it right, it gets a large positive reward. If it guesses and gets it wrong, it gets a large negative reward. Every time it asks a question, it gets a small negative reward to keep these dialogues as short as possible. We have to use RL to figure out when, under all this range of questions that I could ask, clarification, active queries, examples query, label query, what should I ask to maximize my long-term average reward in this text? And then that's what the whole dialogue looks like. And hopefully it's learned a lot from that. And the next dialogue will be more accurate and shorter. And over time, it learns to ask the right questions and learn all the concepts that it needs to do this task well. Was that clear? Now, the policy learning here is a bit tricky because it's a very complicated policy. To get this to work, we found it helps to set it up as a hierarchical policy where we have where we one sub-policy that selects the best clarification question, one sub-policy that selects the best active learning question to ask, and then there's this decision policy on top that decides, should I just guess what the item is right now? Should I ask my best clarification question that my clarification policy, sub-policy picked? Or should I ask the best active query that my active query policy picked? 
And again, we have a, a complicated set of features for the RL to sort of learn a good policy for this. We tried two different RL policies, those of you into RL standard Q learning and this thing called A3C. Don't even ask me what it is. Anyone know what A3C is? It's some, I, I don't do the RL. I'm not the RL expert in this, in this thing. We encode various features that help us learn these policies by including features we think will help with clarification, features we think will help with picking a good example, and people we, features we think will help with deciding when to guess. Um, you know, like even dialogue, because like, the dialogue gets too long, maybe I should just give up, right? Uh, okay, so we tried to build a static hand-built policy to ask these questions in a reasonable way using like standard uncertainty sampling for the active learning. You can read the paper for the details. And we again look at these two important <coughs> metrics. What fraction of the dialogues end in success? And then how long are the dialogues? And we see that, you know, we didn't get, our hand-built policy was not that great. After we do Q learning to learn a policy across all these levels, we actually build a policy that at least a third of the time gets it right and its dialogues are not too long. Now again, if we kept this running, hopefully it would get more accurate and its dialogues would continue to get shorter. So the fully learned policy is significantly more successful than the baseline, all also having significantly shorter dialogues on average. And then we tried various ablations on these things where it's like, what if we learned a clarification policy but we used a static active learning policy and vice versa. I don't think I want to go through all these details, but all the ablations did, did worse. You know, the best thing is to learn policies at all levels. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll stop there and then uh, as the material, and then we'll talk about future work and conclusions, but now's another good time to maybe pause a little bit for if there are any questions. Yeah? Um, so you mentioned that uh, the last two studies were basically simulation-based. No. Have any of this work been extended to user-based scenarios just because I would suspect that the signal-to-noise ratio would be a little it's bit a lot worse. So easier. We did do real user study on that fashion data using the same framework, but instead of having simulated data coming from the label data that we already have, we actually put real users in front of this thing. The results were positive, but significantly less impressive than with the, the generated artificial data, not surprisingly. Um, but the details of that study, I'm sorry, I don't have it in this talk, but the details of the actual user study are in the, the paper, if you want to look. But yeah, so it still works, but not nearly as well as it worked in simulation, duh. <laughs> but, but thanks for the question. Um, if a user wants to teach the robot a new concept, <coughs> can the user ask the robot a question? Like, do you understand this? So this gets at a really good question. This is all, the dialogue is very much system driven, right? It's only the system that can ask questions to the user. Ideally, what you want to have in a dialogue setting is usually what's called mixed initiative, right? Where the system can ask the user question, the user can ask the system question. Great idea that makes it a lot more complicated, particularly if you're using RL to learn a policy for that. Oh, it's just, so very good question. No, this is all system driven, which is typical in the dialogue community, right? Where, you know, uh, it's, it's the system is the one that's driving the dialogue. But ideally, yes, it would be more mixed initiative and the user could take control. It's like, what, you made a mistake. That thing's not gangham, what are you talking about? I, you know, but it's just like, no, but yeah. Be a great direction to go, but you know, mixed initiative dialogue is just makes the whole thing a lot harder. Okay, well, let's wrap up here, and then we can have some time for discussion at the end. So here's sort of addressing this issue: fully integrating these methods with real robots on real tasks and real users. We did a little bit of that with the fashion data. That's still all in simulation. There's no robot there, right? It's just an image classification problem at the end of the day. Of course, it's been really hard to do real robot stuff during COVID. So I'm hoping my new students can get back into the lab working with real robots again, you know, uh, and maybe try to, we're not directly working on this now, but maybe try to get some of these things working on real robots. I mean, so that early videos I showed you, that's all legit. That was done with real robots. We haven't done real robots during COVID or since. Um, I talked about using natural language dialogue to learn new concepts. There's also a whole other task, which is using natural language dialogue to teach a robot to do a new task. Uh, and there's some interesting work in this. Joyce Chai has this interesting paper back in Ishkai in 2018. And I've done another body of my work that I could give a bunch of talks about. My student just graduated, Prasoon Goyle, 
he had some papers in HK19 and Coral 2020, and we have another paper under review right now. That I was talking to several people here about there's this whole interaction between reinforcement learning and natural language. What I talked about today was more what I call RL for NL, using reinforcement learning to learn something that helps you solve language problems, which in this case is learning dialogue policy. This work is more the other way. It says, how can I use natural language to improve reinforcement learning rather than trying to use reinforcement learning to improve language? And you actually use language to help a reinforcement learning. We use this on one of these classic uh, video game domains. So the hardest of the so-called Atari suite, you know, which was DeepMind got famous for doing all these Atari games with deep, deep RL. The hardest one was what Montezuma's Revenge. I don't know, I don't play video games, but that was the one that Deep RL did the worst at. We showed if you if you give some language instructions and you say, why well, the classic example always have is jump over the the basket and climb up the ladder or something like that, you know, and you, you give it language instruction, sort of aiding it to play the game, the RL can learn a lot faster if you, you tell it in language at various times what is good. And you can read these, these papers if you want to learn that approach. But the whole idea, how can we use language to help teach robots tasks more effectively rather than just getting them to learn concepts like, you know, like gingham or, you know, or rattling or something like that. There's a lot more that could be done in the HRI side. I was talking to our, you know, our HRI folks here. You know, add eye tracking to this, gesture, disfluency, you know, lots of things we could improve the dialogue. In particular, I like this last bullet here, using emotion and frustration to detect and influence the rewards. So if you see a user's getting very frustrated and it starts yelling at your robot, that's like, whoa, whoa, negative, huge negative reward on whatever I did, right? You know, and learn from that behavior. And there's lots of work, nice work on, you know, both from vocal and, and visual signals to detect emotions. I think it'd be really cool to, in, on the HRI side of things, is to get those signals and use them as part of the reward function. Say, if, hey, if the user's getting angry, I can really get a large negative reward. If the user seems very happy, then I get a big positive reward. I must have done something right. And then put that into this whole framework so that the rewards, right now, we had to set these rewards this much for getting accomplishing a task, this much for asking a question. Ideally, those rewards would be much more fungible and learnable based on the behavior of my users and the reaction to my behavior. And that'd be a cool area to expand in. OK, so to wrap up here. I think robot dialogue is a challenging, high-impact problem. There's a lot of work in robo-NLP. I would argue it's still even, this talk is a little but still there's not a lot of work in robo-dialogue, actually engaging robots in dialogue and the connection between dialogue. There's a lot of work, you know, with chit-chat dialogue and task dialogue. There's very little work on actual robot dialogue. I think there could be a lot more. But I think it's a high-impact problem that's attracting some increase in attention, but not a lot. And it requires Financial recent progress in a lot of areas, particularly deep learning for language and grounding and dialogue and robotics and manipulation. There's just lots of stuff that goes into this. So we've developed some methods we think are helpful in trying to allow a system to do lifelong learning for these sort of robot or sort of visually grounded sort of dialogue tasks by acquiring knowledge by allowing the system to ask both clarification questions and what we call opportunistic active learning queries. And we tried to show that you can actually learn how and when to ask those questions in the most effective way by using reinforcement learning to acquire an effective dialogue policy that uses such queries to optimize overall task performance in the long run. OK. Thank you. So we hopefully have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Yeah, I appreciate the interaction during the talk. It's so much like better being in a live audience with real people asking you questions than Zooming. We're all tired of Zooming. So, good question. Sure. So, the dialogue, by its very nature, is not Markovian. Like, you have, have memory and everything to engage in dialogue. Sure. What, what made you choose reinforcement learning? As opposed to... Something else which is, uh, has memory in it to learn the policies. Well, I mean, a lot is encoded in the state, right? I mean, we maintain a state that's very rich, right? Because in some sense, I would argue, you know, that the state is encoding a lot of that history information. So, uh, because it has a rich set of features describing the state and the action. And a lot of those features, again, I didn't dive into the details of all of those, but a lot of those are capturing information that's occurred throughout the dialogue in the past. So I think there's a lot of that contextual information that is being encoded in the very rich state that these systems are using. 
Now, does it strictly make it Markovian? Probably not, but much closer to it than you might think. Because those states are very rich states with, and again, there's a lot of engineering that goes into, again, for people who appreciate RL, when you're not doing table-based RL and you're learning, the, you know, uh, from a, a featural representation of your actions and, and, and state information, it, you really need to give it the right representation there to learn from effectively. And there is a fair bit of manual engineering of those features, and you could look at all the detail. I purposely you know, skimmed over that because there is a lot of hand engineering. But I think it is capturing a lot of the state information that you want that makes this test, the task at least, sort of what, quasi microbian or something? But what do you think would be an alternative? I, you know, uh, that's the big thing is, you know. Yeah. I have a question regarding the common sense of the quantization system. So, we have considered the users, <coughs> like the same sense of different meaning for different users. You know, there's a lot of work in personalization where maybe you learn to adapt to understand particular users. You know, I think it's a very interesting point. I think the same framework could be used there, but we didn't specifically look at that. All the learning happens across all the users. We use the same system for every user. It's never tailoring itself. To a particular user, but I don't think there's no, there's nothing fundamental that would prevent you from using this framework to tailor assist you know tailor the robot to work with you. It just means you just you, the only data you see is the data from that user. So my, my view of this would be first you train a system to across a wide variety of users, and then you put it into somebody's particular house, and then let it learn. It still continues to lifelong learn, yeah. but it'll lifelong learn to adapt to that particular user for the task for that thing. So that's my idea of lifelong learning is. The system's constantly adapting and changing based on its interaction. And if you just stop it interacting with anybody else but you, it's going to tail its behavior to you. Yeah, right, cool. Thank you. Oh, sure. so, is it possible to make the whole pipeline more inter interpretable? For example, we want to know why the robot wants to ask a specific question. Yeah, I talked to several people here about explainable AI. Where's Ben? You know, Ben and I were on the explainable AI project together, right? You know. That's, I have worked in that, I've not connected it with this, but there's a lot of techniques in explainable AI to take these sort of deep networks and try to explain their behavior to users. Not easy, so I've never thought about the connection between this work. I, I do explainable VQA, so I've done some work in where you do, this is a grounded task, a little bit different than this robot commanding sort of task, but where you ask a question, you're like, why did you answer? My classic example there is we have this system that it asks, what type of room is this? And the system, and the system says, it's a bathroom. And the, and the user says, well, why? And it, and it highlights, it says, well, this object in blue is a toilet, and this object in green is a sink. Uh, and uh, I've learned that sinks and toilets are usually in bathrooms, right? And that's why I answered. So I have done some work in explainable VQA, and I think some of those same ideas could possibly be brought to this domain. You're like, why do you think this is gingham? Because this, who knows what gingham actually is? I shouldn't use that example. I actually don't even know what gingham is. But it could say, oh, it has this particular checkered pattern on it or something that, you know, or something. I don't know. But I think there's a lot of work in, you know, explainable AI for, for visual systems. There's, you know, we're talking to people about grad cam. Who was I talking to grad cam about? Someone who's probably here. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of work in explainable visual image classification. And I think you could apply those techniques to what the classifiers that it eventually ends up learning for this. Because this is basically just controlling the training data that's used. The underlying learning, you know, architecture is good old-fashioned deep learning for vision stuff, right? And anything that applies to that to make it more explainable, you could use in this study. I do have a question. So for, like, I know that the spirit of the, the like, active learning is kind of to adapt to new um, or personalize and everything. So have you ever made, like, so there is this new trend on, on continual or, or lifelong learning trying to measure also the catastrophic forgetting. Uh, so, for example, if you have a system, a robot that is trained to maybe in, uh, identify uh, actions on, on objects and so on, and then you, you shift the, the domain to, let's say, the fashion, right, the, the colors and the, all of that. So, it, well, so if you the learn stuff, the, the classifiers, the data is all being collected incrementally. But the learning is actually happening batch, you know, it's like it's still using all the old data. So, so that if, you, if you do experiments after train, find like, let's say, training activities towards the fashion, if you go back to the, 
to the actions it will perform still as good as before? No, but it depends how you handle the, the training there. You know, like I said, this isn't really doing incremental training. So it's just accumulating all of its data, and then it's rebatch training the classifiers at every, you know, at every iteration. Between that's why we do things in batches. We don't just do it after every user because we don't have the real time capability to retrain everything in real time. That's why we do batches of users, and we only retrain between batches where you can do a batch training. And, and do that. So it's an interesting question, but, but I wouldn't say the learning here is really actually incremental, which is where catastrophic forgetting really got, because we're retaining all the old training data, and it's constantly retraining on all the data. And so and now, that doesn't scale. You know, These experiments are on small enough scale where we can afford to do that. In reality, you would have to do incremental learning, in which case these issues would come up, and then I don't know if I have any great answers. But yeah, I mean, I think this idea is in the lifelong learning setting. You are adapting to the new environment, so you might forget the old stuff. So you are going to get better at dealing with this user, but then if you're sold and go to another user, you're probably going to do worse because you're going to learn all these bad habits from the, your current user or something. I don't know. Okay, well, thanks. Everybody.